Um, look, thank you very much, uh, Sheila. It's actually interesting um, uh, for those that are here. We uh, I got a call probably I don't know, two, three months ago about this uh, summit, if you like, or uh, series of speeches and uh, gatherings. And uh, and for those that know Sheila, she's actually a very persuasive and uh, persistent person. And she was telling me things about what we were doing at Carlton that I didn't even know. And uh, that it, we have got a green bench at our place, and it probably was driven by a couple of things, uh, planets aligning before before I get into it. But obviously, one of our major sponsors has been busy through the uh, the Pratt family, and obviously they're uh, cutting edge and leading in this space of um, sustainability. and um, And so they've really had an influence on us initially, and then there was a uh, a second uh, thing that happened to us, which was and Simon Gores here, we got approached by the AFL that the Victorian government were keen to uh, provide funding to all the clubs to uh, increase, uh, sorry, to redevelop their facilities, but they wanted a uh, bit of a catch for the clubs to focus on a, a given area that would help the, uh, help uh, certainly in Victoria, help, help uh, a whole variety of people. So. Richmond went first and they, they've developed a facility which uh, has an Aboriginal flavour. They do a lot of work with the Aboriginal community, so they've got that sort of a facility. Down at North Melbourne, theirs is a community-based project. And we uh, felt that we would do a, uh, a green facility, if you like, and that was uh, something that we went to the government with and uh, they assisted us in funding. We, we obviously got funding from a variety of sources, but we spent $20 million on a facility that is as green as any facility in, uh, in the country, and that was that's how we got into it. And then from that, we developed, developed some other programs. So that was the basis for uh, Sheila ringing me and saying, well, can we come and have a chat? So there it is. As I said, the planets aligned, and off we went. Um, I don't know if you've got part. We'll go. Uh, so we've had, um, we just saw Chris Judd there, and we've got a little bit of flack about that too. He's, a, he's actually busy and a green ambassador. And uh, yeah, there's been a lot of press about his role within uh, Visi, but even before he came to the club, he was a driver of a Prius. He's actually very environmentally conscious. And it just helped um, help with us to sell the message, I suppose, that the club was a um, you know a, a club that was serious about this uh, involvement. And so Chris became our, our uh, ambassador for Vizi and also just ourselves with our Bloom stamp on, I suppose. That's just a little bit of history for those that don't know about us. We're there's uh, people from Essendon here, they'll probably say they're the most successful club, but we're equal with Essendon in 16 premierships, so we're, at least we're equal, but uh, because we've done the slide, we'll say we're the most successful club. Uh, and yeah, look, we have, we, we're a, a very recognisable brand. It was a little bit of a stretch for us to go into this, uh, into the area, but it's been something that's worked really well for us. Um, we do a lot of community-based programs, but now they are, we've, uh, then we do a lot of things that are, I suppose, certainly around our local environment. We have a lot of people in the flats, a lot of uh, people from the Horn of Africa that come and uh, live around Carlton. So we do a lot of work with them, mostly around healthy living and also and then also the green element to it. Uh, Visi assist us with these programs, so uh, we have you know whole whole range of things with the flats. And these are some of the kids that. Um, that we deal with. I think, I don't know if it's on one of the, it might be on one of these slides later, but I think within the, uh, our municipality, it's certainly been done, and it's only an area of probably three or four kilometres from the club. There's something like 95 nationalities that go to the schools, and um, it's, it's massive, uh, the multicultural aspect of the flats and everything around our, our facility. Um, so with sustainability, with our, with, when we developed our uh, new facility at Busy Park, one of the things was, there's a whole lot of things that we wanted to look at. And um, the first thing was saving water at the time, which is uh, look, probably a little bit like the decel plan. The minute you uh, budget to save water, down it comes, and you uh, 
you don't need to save as much. But we've got, we're self, pretty much self uh, efficient in water. So our ground, and obviously we play a lot of football there. There's, we, we obviously train there. Our uh, affiliate team, the Northern Blues, train there. The umpire, the AFL umpires train at our ground. The Melbourne Rebels train at our ground. Um, after the result on the weekend, sounds like they need to train a bit harder. Uh, they got beaten 64-7 or something, so just for those that didn't see that. So we collect all of our own water. We've got great, great water treatment. Um, you know, and everything we used to have was, uh, we you know, just came out of the ground, came out of taps and things. So we, we've really focused heavily on, uh, on doing our own water, and that's been a, a really significant saving for us. Um, certainly, in the f we've been open for about 18 months, so um, the tanks, yeah, have uh, uh, proven their weight in gold. The ground itself's in, in pretty good nick uh, for, for the amount of traffic it gets, but water was one of the main focuses for us. Uh, second thing was the, obviously the efficiency with uh, energy. It's actually for those, and all the clubs are building these facilities now, that's just a bit of a snapshot of our indoor where uh, Mick walks the players through and that photo of the uh, where the green grass is, that, that opens up and so the players can go out onto there as well. So that's a, a massive indoor space. And obviously the building itself is quite a large building. So again, one of the things that we wanted to do was obviously re reduce our uh, greenhouse gas, gas emissions, but also to actually save a lot of uh, energy by heating and cooling the, the place in, uh, in summer. So one of the, um, we've got a lot of natural light and ventilation. We hardly use our, um, uh, air conditioning or heating, we don't need to. It's, it's incredible how well the place works. There's probably people here that are more technically minded than I am, but somehow if you open the window this way and the wind comes that way, it somehow manages to keep it cool. It's quite amazing what's happening in our place. We've got motion detectors for all our lighting. Uh, nothing stays on very long at all. Actually, every now and again, when you're sitting in your office, you have to just wave your arms around <laughs> and make sure the lights come back on. But again, it's something that we've done uh, done uh, by choice and um, you know there's a whole lot of other things there the gym we've got our own obviously pool all the things that are in there and we've again saved an enormous amount of money just by making sure that the design was um, first class and was suitable for what we needed uh, this, this one's a really interesting one this is sort of a busy uh, this was the busy uh, sponsor we don't have bins you see that photo there on the left we all have, uh, everything's recyclable in our place. Um, yeah, we don't, uh, as I said, we don't have any bins in our offices. We have obviously paper, uh, paper collectors, if you like, but everything else is put into, uh, you know, the, the appropriate facilities, I suppose. We, as I said, we do a lot of work with Visi. Uh, we've turned it, yeah, 80% waste diversion from landfill targeting our demolition. So we did that when we, knocked over the old building and brought, brought the, uh, the new one in. And, the, you know, the operation of waste management was actually interesting because at early doors, you know, you just, you just used to throwing all your stuff in the bin, but it, it's, not, it's actually not a very long stretch to make sure you put the, uh, you know, the plastics in a plastic thing, the paper in a paper thing, and just general rubbish in general rubbish. And it's actually, again, saved us a lot of time and money. And, uh, and we think we're putting a, an imprint on the... Uh, certainly on our area, but on our building as well. But we have, um, within the club itself, we've got about, uh, what have we got now, 65 employees. That's not including the players. So, you know, there's a lot of people around, and then we've got our own um, uh, cafe and things that all the other people in the facility use. And as I said, we've got Football Victoria with us. I forgot to mention them as well. So we've got a lot of people in the precinct, and everybody's uh, on board with this, the way we're going. And this is uh, another thing that we do. So not only do we improve the building or make sure that it was as green as we could possibly get, we actually have certainly, uh, this is the thing that we're probably most proud about. We actually have an education, it's called Enviromaniacs, we call it. And it's, uh, again, it's sponsored by Busy, as you can see there. But we bring, well, there, there are 180 school students a week come through the centre. Uh, that's our, during the day, that's our lecture theatre for the players and things that all there, that's Mick sort of telling them where to run and not run and all those sort of things. But when the, uh, we can turn it into the, the training, uh, sorry, uh, education facility for the kids. Um, and we just go through with them pretty simple things, you know, the same things I spoke about, sustainability, recycling, 
uh, you know, the, the lights, all the things that we talk about. We, uh, you know, what we what we do, we show them. We have a, our thing is. Some of the people think they're pretty clever coming up with these, but the Visi Effective Disposals Program, so we have competitions amongst the schools as well. And um, it's been, you know, as I said, we get a lot of kids through, and we're, we're hoping and we think we are making a difference in the way they go back. And as I said, we, it's an ongoing thing. We don't just bring them in and forget them. They, they run competitions amongst themselves. Uh, you know, uh, we've got all sorts of uh, facilities where they're online, they come in and they show us every week what they've done and how they've saved things and uh, what they're doing with their rubbish and and we uh, we keep that going. That's been a really effective uh, program, the Environmaniacs program. Well, here's, uh, here's a bit more about it. So, yeah, the, the, and the young kids, the grade three to six, uh, yeah, grades three to six, one of the things we actually we know from the program is that they actually go back and have a fair influence on their parents because that's part of the program to actually ask, you know, we'll pull their parents up about, you know, why don't we have separate bins for cans and uh, general rubbish or paper. I mean, obviously everybody at home now has their, well, certainly in my uh, municipality, it's a, green, it's a uh, yellow uh, lid for paper and things, but not a lot of kids that when you talk to them at school, have that, so it's one of the things we have. 15 of our players um, are ambassadors, environmental ambassadors, so yeah, they're online with the kids as well and talking to them about active and sustainable living. So not only, we also obviously focus on healthy living and eating. We've got our dietitian who does a program for the kids as well about healthy eating and stuff as well as the environment thing. So we think we're making a difference. Yeah, we have 100 classes, yeah, two and a half thousand students have been through. We've been doing this, we did this actually, started doing this well before we did our facility, but it's actually been a lot more advantageous for us with the new facility. So it's been, uh, it's been terrific. We get this ticked off by the AFL, obviously, to have our ambassadors working, but it's an ongoing program. It's something that um, the kids really enjoy and uh, it works really well. So that's the Environmaniac. So, and we've, as I said, we've got the facility. We can walk them around at our at busy park. We'll show them what we do with the water. Um, you know, we're encouraging all our staff to ride to work. We try and we offer incentives for people to ride to work instead of driving to work. So, we've got a whole lot of programs internally that we, we're trying to introduce as well. Um, yeah, there's a few. Um, we do a few uh, new looks with uh, avatars and things. I'm just laughing because some of the players uh, walk past and make some alterations to some of these things with their other players. So it's actually uh, there's some quite funny things that happen on those uh, on those walls. But uh, you know, there's a pledge wall. They make a promise on what they're going to do. Um, we also. Sometimes, depending on the schools, we actually supply them with some uh, wheelie bins and recycling bins and things like that that the teach, uh, some of the schools can't afford to do themselves. So we do all those things as well. So, you know, as I said, it's set up really, uh, really well. And there's just some of the examples along the walls with the uh, For a Better World and, this, and the pledges and everything else that happens. So that, that were, that's another thing that's been really successful as well. Um, one of the things, uh, when I spoke to Sheila about doing this, I said, look, it's probably easy to uh, answer questions. So just, I'm just giving you a brief snapshot of what we do, or some of the things that we do. Um, it's, you know, we also do a super clinic every year for all the kids that come along, and last year Penny Wong came as, as well to uh, open it for us. As I said, that pledge DVD is, uh, we give that to all the kids as well in all the schools, just, you know, what, you know, say Chris Judd, which, and it's amazing the influence players have. I mean, we've spoken about this forever and a day. Um, players have an amazing influence on kids. If, uh, you know, you, you hear of the stories of Chris, you know, Chris Judd told me that I should turn my lights off when I leave the room, or Chris Judd told me that I should uh, separate the rubbish. It, it's an, it has an incredible impact on the kids, and um, especially those kids around, as I said, the years three to six, because they're pretty, uh, Pretty, well, not easily influenced, but they're influenced by their heroes, and uh, and it's one of the things that's worked really well for us. And we also have a green round every year that we um, we implement with the AFL, 
and we uh, we started that and it's working well as well. So it's that same thing. It's uh, I think in the green round last year we might even turn the lights off at the ground for a couple of minutes before, you know, before the players came on just to sort of give another um, another uh, example of you know just trying to help the environment. It's really interesting. Just a little bit a little bit of politics, I suppose, with the. Uh, when we did this, and when we first started this, say four or five years ago, it was, uh, and I think Sheila just touched on it a little bit. The green, the green element of all this was actually quite, you know, really positive, and um, and you know we got a lot of uh, good publicity and a lot of you know pluses for it. Not that we do it for that, but that's that that was interesting at the time. It's just it's just been interesting to watch the politics of the Greens. You know, after the state election here, they got belted, and they've sort of been, you know, they were a little bit. They're not as uh, popular, the Green Party, if you like, and anything green, as Sheila touched on, is sort of now got a little bit of a query on it. You know, what uh, what are you guys up to? What are you, you know, uh, we're in, we're actually, it's interesting enough, we're in a seat, if you like, or it's a marginal seat, it's actually fought out between Labor and the Greens. So we, uh, we've got a little bit of flack from some Labor people about, you know, this looks like it's a supporting the Greens in our area and things like that. So. Some of the politics is interesting, so. But anyway, it is what it is, and we uh, we do it not for any political reasons. We do it because we think it's the right thing to do, and it's been a really successful program, and obviously something that uh, we're going to keep doing. And we think it has made a difference. It certainly made a difference for us. And I mean, even those little things. I mean, putting I'm actually a chartered accountant by profession. The things that we do with the building and everything around it, it actually saves us money as well. So it's you know it's really worth worth doing, and it's been something that's. Uh, been really successful for us. So um, that's really a bit of a snapshot. I was, I was just going to say, has anybody got any questions or queries about uh, anything that we're up to? Yeah. I do. You know, back to your environmental um, program, and you have to excuse me because I don't know the, you know, the dynamics of an actual AFL game. But can you turn, you know, all those those about hundreds of students, thousands of students coming into group sales for those kids to come to the game to yeah. get some revenue? Yeah, we do that. It's actually, it's, again, it's an interesting one because uh, most kids in this country are rusted onto a team by birth, you know, it's not, uh, and we're different than, say, the states where you live in a city and that's, you know, you're a one city town, or sorry, one town, yeah, one city team, I should say, so. Um, so they're rusted on, so we, we're a bit careful that we don't upset people and sort of, Carltonise them on their way through, but we certainly try to do that. And, uh, <laughs> we um, we give them show bags and caps and stickers and you know all the, th all the things that are environmentally. Actually, I think we cut the stickers out because we didn't think they were environmentally friendly. But um, yeah, we do do that, and um, and we do give them access to games. They you know we've got a register of everybody that's come through as well, and we send as I said we exchange emails with them. Uh, and some of the lesser drawing games, we've actually brought the kids along. We've actually used, uh, we had a competition last year. I think 30 of them got to form a guard of honour as the players ran onto the ground for one of the games. So, you know, all those things that we do do, yeah, to try and cartonise it a bit. Um, it's a generational thing, we'll see how it goes. But it's certainly with the, uh, the amount of uh, immigrants that we've got around the area, you know, who don't know anything about AFL uh, football, we think that's... Uh, it, it, it hopefully will um, give us a new base of fans um, as we go forward. Yeah. Good yeah. morning, very well, Kel. Um, I'm a greenie and quite happy with the Appalachian, frankly, and I don't go to conferences, and so it doesn't matter if you're here, even if you're an economist or a banker. Um, I, I think the biggest impact that the AFL has uh, in terms of sustainability is transport. It's the transport of your players and aeroplanes and, and players in Perth or Brisbane or whatever. Yeah. What are, you, are you doing anything uh, and even getting your fans to your home ground games in Melbourne? Are you doing anything in your education program about educating people about using public transport? Yeah, we, as, as I touched on before, we actually encourage, we've got a massive area for bikes at our place that we're trying to get people to ride to work. We also, uh, the players themselves drove this, which was good. It wasn't something that was driven by the players. When, when you're flying, you can tick that box to uh, pay extra for um, the carbon offset. They all do that. I mean, for what it's worth, I don't know, it's not much. It's only a fuck or whatever it is, but you know, they do it and they do it um, uh, willingly and it was their idea. Um, 
yeah, we do that. We do that. It's actually the irony of um, our place is that there was a review. Simon might talk about it later. There was a review a couple of years ago about returning our ground to play out the footy, and the thing that knocked it over was that it's got poor transport <laughs> around it. Uh, but it hasn't. It's got trams and things. A lot of you, we've got Monash Uni across the road. We've had a talk about Monash. So they're across the road from us. They do their pharmaceutical work. We're just waiting for the uh, state government to build that tunnel. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> so now look, we do we do a lot about that. We do, uh, yeah. We one of the things that's an advantage for us is uh, being a big club. We don't travel very often, which is good. We only travel five times a year, so uh, <laughs> so that's a plus as well. But now we do we do do work on that. Uh, we obviously encourage most of our players live live relatively local, and we actually encourage them to uh, pick each other up on the way there because obviously they've all got the same schedules. So yeah, we do work at that. It's uh, uh, and again carpooling out to the airport when they do fly because we uh, you know again putting an economic hat on as well. Uh, we'd rather just pay you know four of them go to a car park instead of paying four bills for a car park because they all put a claim in. And so yeah, no, we, we're mindful of that and we try and. Um, work on that and it's it's been a bit of a slow burn but certainly the carpooling and getting the training with each other has been a, a real plus and and the other thing is with our car park if anyone that's been there our car park's actually full because we've got so many people there so it's actually been it makes sense for them to uh to carpool to try and get everybody in there yeah great um obviously the state government played a fairly large role in assisting you with the Catholics of what you've undertaken how much of what you guys have done could have happened without state government support? And leading on to that, with all of the sort of changes in, in practices and the changes in infrastructure, what's the return on investment? So how much are you saving in, in, a, in a dollar situation where you function yearly as compared to what you've been through? Yeah, well, one of the... Um, well, the short answer is without government assistance, we couldn't have, couldn't have built the facility. We, we got uh, four and a half million well, round, there's a round numbers, four and a half million from the federal government, but two million from the state government, we've got a million from the local council, uh, we've got about three and a half from the AFL, and we funded the rest ourselves. But those things were pivotal because we uh, we, we couldn't have done it without them. And e with each of those um, tranches of money, there were conditions on it, um, some of them green related. Uh, for example, state government said there was no gaming at that facility, which we used to have gaming machines, but we didn't, we were happy to let them go. Um, the local council, we use our pool for um, the elderly who come in uh, from probus groups and do their rehab and uh, wa wa water work at our pool. Um, Lions clubs, probus groups, uh, use our uh, meeting rooms and things like that. So we've got a, we've actually got a very much a community basis uh, around those funds. Um, for the government, yeah, an interesting question about return on investment. Um, we probably, we do, we do certainly do a lot more with the Melbourne City Council. They probably put in the least, but they're the ones that we do the most work with. Um, state government, uh, it's a different state government now. I mean, they probably view uh, their money as a more of a uh, grant as distinct from anything else, and so. We don't. We, we have to obviously submit reports about what we're doing uh, on a yearly basis, but we don't hear very much from the state government at all. So it's more to do with, which is probably fair enough. I mean, the local council, Robert Doyle, we have meetings with him quite often about uh, what's happening at the facility, who's using it, um, you know, can we get more people in there, how do we do all those things, and we're obviously really open to that. As I said, we have a lot of people coming through. We have a lot of school children. We have a lot of, um, as I said, all the local. Um, we even had the, uh, there was a group who have been strongly opposed to anything happening at Visit Park, which is um, uh, the local residents group, and even they've met at our place now, so they're, uh, they've uh, sort of come full circle and, um, using the facilities as well. So, so that, that's, that's the onus for us, yeah, to make sure that everybody around the area can use it. Anyone else? Oh, I'll go, Sheila. No, no, you go. Sounds like you have a lot of the players on board, and your offices are um, catered to doing really sustainable practices with the particular bins that you have. And how did you get everyone on board for to, to undertake? I mean, not everyone believes in sustainability, and 
No. Well, it was. <laughs> no. No, no, not everyone does. I mean, we, we were probably lucky. We had at, at the time, and again, for the people from America, our, well, actually, he's not captain any longer, but the, the captain of our time, team was probably at, at his peak the number one player in the competition. As I said, he was a very green person. And so when he said, this is what we should do, most of them followed. <laughs> um, but certainly from a club point of view, we spoke, we just put it all, we just put it on the table about what, uh, which way we wanted to go. As I said at the start of it, there was a lot of options that, uh, coming back to the state government point, they had a lot of things that they wanted to do via football clubs, whether it was working with the Aboriginal community, working with general community, working with underprivileged and things like that. And so we took on this part, but we took it on and took it on seriously. So we spoke to the players about, you know, we can't just take the money and do nothing, you know, and just run like we'd normally run. So they, they've had terrific buy-in, and, and you touched on before, we've, We've actually become really socially conscious. We have uh, two of our guys now go out every Wednesday night with the um, food vans at the Salvation Army, and you know they're they're doing a great job and they love doing it. And uh, and I think there's going to be a couple more guys go with them because uh, one of them, Mitchie Robinson, he probably relates really well with the street kids. He's he's, almost, he's not too far removed from one himself, but uh, he's going really well on, on uh, working with the Salvation Army. We've got a lot of guys doing not just these programs, but a whole lot of other things. We've got. Um, Nick Dygan does some work. He's actually a trained uh, psychologist, so he, he does a lot of work with the uh, kids down at the flats at Carlton. He's got a program running down there for more for the, for the kids that have come from war torn countries who have got sort of almost psychological issues. He works with them as well, and there's a football flavour to that. So we're really proud of all the guys that have, we, you know, we've got a lot of uh, people doing a lot of different things in the community, and it's something that we, you know, we've taken on board. and. Uh, we just do because we think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Can I just uh, extend that line of thinking? Um, I know in the NBA, a lot of the teams will ask each of their players, what's your social legacy or what would you like to leave behind as an athlete during the time that you have all of this attention and, and influence? Um, is there a formal process that goes on in Carlton that's similar to that? Because it sounds like a lot of your players are involved in socially minded activities. Yeah, it's probably not as strong as, I mean, I've had a look at those uh, NBA cares. I mean, one of the advantages we got, we, we go to travel overseas every year and have a look at what other clubs and other codes and competitions are doing. Um, with our, we've got a fundamental issue uh, within the club. We've obviously got um, our careers advisor in there who actually used to do the same job at Xavier College, so he's, he's on board with us now. Nobody at our place is, is does nothing. So, you know, you have a vast, what have we got now? There's 44 teams. You have a whole lot of different people. You know, you've got obviously some smart ones and not so smart ones. And uh, But we don't let them do nothing. And so we actually push the guys that are, who don't want to do more education work or, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, courses of some degree into the uh, community work. And that's that's been our focus. And and, they've, and as I said, they've really enjoyed it. They've adopted it. You know, and some of the look, it's not for everybody as well, because you've got to have a, um, well, not a skill, but you've, you've got to enjoy it. Otherwise, we don't want them to go out there and sort of, you know, grump around and make it bad for the kids or whatever else happens. So we, uh, we work with them and train them up about what, what their roles are. But in the main, somebody, you have to do something. If you're not studying, you've got to do something else at our place. You might have to work part time or you might have to do a community program. And most, unfortunately, most of them are doing community programs. So that's good. Yeah. Sorry, Greg. Um, we, you talked about today what, what Carlton have, have done over the last sort of four, five, six years. Um, what's the next phase um, that you'll be looking at? What's, what's in the future or is it sort of holding on to this and sort of seeing when all the other clubs catch up to you or is it sort of being uh, on the front foot? Um, yeah, look, it's a good question. We, uh, we just finished a strategic plan uh, for the next five years. And in it, we talked about taking this to another level. Um, and now the devil's in the detail about how we actually do that, <laughs> you know, so, um, but it's probably, it's, it's more time and more more uh, resources into it. You know, we, not only, I mean, I've spoken here about the players, but we've also got a, a team of, uh, in, in, a, in an area in our place, fan development and community involvement. We've got seven people in that. And so they do a lot of work as well. And we've actually talked about beefing that up and putting more resources to that and getting more people on. 
whilst I said the players are a great influence, it's not the be all and end all. Some of the, a lot of the follow up work or the clinics or the stuff that's done online, you know, there's others who can do that. And so that's probably the focus for us now is to uh, get more involvement. I mean, we'd love to have more schools through, but physically you just can't, you can't get the time. And um, but there's been a lot of advances from the AFL as well. Like that, you know, we've got the set day off now, so we know what can happen on every Thursday. Everybody's off on a Thursday, and Thursday's our day of getting out and doing uh, and doing things. So um, yeah, we, we it's working, and we, we want to put more resources into it. But that's what it is in the end. It's just resource driven, and probably time. Time's another constraint. Mm. So many questions. Oh, good. <laughs> is there any reporting that you do, like public reporting on your website or anything for the different advancements or the resources that you have for this? Um, yeah, look, at the, we do do it on our website. We don't report. We had a discussion internally. We're not, we don't want to look like we're uh, self promoting. We just want to do it. And, um, yeah, we, we don't make a, we don't lodge or make do public press releases or we you don't know, get we are or what we've done or we just don't do that. We just we think we've always felt that this program is something that we do um, without looking to you know getting any pets on the back or anything like that. So they sort of hopefully they'll come anyway. But um, yeah, we don't report very very much on it. No. And on the flip side, have you been criticised at all about not going far enough from different external but, groups? Yeah, no, well, cert certainly when we did do a report to the council because they called us in one time and said, we don't think you're doing enough. And then we sent the stuff in and they said, oh, hang on, yes, you are, you're going okay. So um, so there's been a couple, that, that's the only time that that's happened. We actually got something in the Robert Doyle's office and said, you know, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And we said, yes, we are, yes, we are, yes, we are. So um, they were happy after that. And um, but yeah, no, we don't. We we still don't feel the need to make a big song and dance about it. We just think we we do it. And um, yeah, you know, and the, I suppose that yeah, you know, we know we know ourselves what we're doing. We know we're making an impact. We get a lot of good feedback from the schools, you know, principals or the teachers that have come in. You know, they just think the program's fantastic. So we've obviously got a compilation of all those things, but uh, we don't necessarily report it or publicise it too much. No. Dave, you know. <laughs> Actually, how did you find out about all the things we did? Did you pick that up on the web or where did you find it? Because well, as I said, when you rang me, you said they know more about it than I did. No, it's because it's your uh, very high profile relationship with Vissi and then obviously the not so positive uh, media around the Chris Judd thing. But I, I figured to explore a little bit further on that and um, saw that you were doing amazing things. But um, I'm wondering with um, your, your, ch your choices, um, and decision making around the schools that you um, work with and um, what programs you say yes to and um, from an external point of view but also um, from a facility point of view what you choose you know how you've chosen all those um, areas how do you come to those decisions is there a committee or um, do your partners come in and speak to you about advise you on what would be priority areas? And yeah, we, we, work, we work really strongly with the education department, yeah, and um, as I said, we focus on schools with high uh, multicultural elements, and you, you know, um, we had a game last year for, luckily at our place we've got an ability to sort of close the ground off, if you like, even to the public if we need to, and we had a, 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 a Muslim woman's uh, football game because, you know, they, they don't obviously and we close the ground so that they could just play without people watching and things like that because you know that, that's part of the culture that they don't like that so it was actually it was quite amazing you know everybody running around with the full you know the bales and the whole lot playing footy it was actually it was a pretty amazing day and they loved it and um, so we yeah coming back to the original question we use the education department primarily into schools that have, have, have high levels of multicultural and, and close by, re re relatively close by. I mean, now our focus here is the local area and probably where our members, the members heartland, end up up through the Diamond Valley, there, which is where the majority of our members live. So they're the schools that we work with now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Question. Um, my interest is internally, as leadership, and as part of the team that really talks to your organization, how do you mobilize internally to get your employees to really live this concept? It's something that, you know, modeling the way, especially in an area like this, um, how, how well do you see that also growing in your organization? Have you noticed anything? One of the things we've learned probably over, we've learned from the football department, we've, we've always found that um, whatever you measure or put a strong focus on is what people's mindset you know, uh, falls into. Like for example, if the coach this weekend for our first game has a focus on tackling, you can guarantee that they'll all tackle because that's sort of, that's the focus. And so from a administrator's point of view, our focus is living and doing these green things and you know at our staff meetings we, you know, we get people up to talk about what they've been up to, we have awards, we have, um, yeah, it's part of our curriculum I suppose, you know, without, I'm not trying to you know, hold it in now, but it is part of the DNA, you know, you, you, we talk about it all the time, who's been doing what, we give people time off, you know, some of the other staff go and work in the programs as well, so we encourage that and we talk about it. And we just, you know, we don't make it that, um, we, we just make it that it's part of your job. Yeah, you know, we don't make it anything special. It's part of your job. And uh, and that's how we do it. You know, we, we, as I said, we, we find, we find from when, a, when you take a football analogy and put it into, into the rest of the business, it actually works. So whatever we measure generally gets addressed. And, you know, if we have a, week where we want to focus on something you can guarantee that that happens but this is sort of just part of what we do. Yeah. Mate, uh, old duck habits die hard. Well, what, what have you found more challenging in, in the transition to, in being the sustainable sort of model that you have? Um, probably people from outside the club. Like we actually get peeved that yeah, when we have games at the ground, people come and they, you know, we've got the bins and they don't use the right bins and they throw stuff on the ground and we sort of have a working beat and clean it up. And, um, internally, it's been pretty good. Like, it's, um, it hasn't been a big stretch. As I said, we, we educated pretty strongly when we went down this path because, as I said at the start, we couldn't go down this path, accept everybody's money, build a facility that, you know, whether we liked it or not, was was a terrifically green facility and then just, you know, go on like we'd normally been going on. We had to actually, you know, live live part of the, uh, or live the experience if you like. And so, um, no, the challenge, it, it's been pretty good. You know, we haven't had to call anybody in or, you know, and everybody, as I said, we've, a couple of guys haven't been wedded to it, so we just don't involve them in the program, but, and that's, uh, you know, that's going to happen, but other than that, it's been, but everybody's been pretty good with it. Yeah. Greg, what are, um, what are your members saying? Are you, are you noticing any, um, I guess, noticeable changes within your member satisfaction surveys and those types of things with relation to? Yeah, uh, only a little bit. Again, it's probably, a lot of them don't, aren't really aware of how, how much we do in the space, um, and again, that's something that we've spoken about. That that part of the, that part of what we do, we, we need to uh, communicate more. But in the feedback that we do, you know, on our Facebook and all the things that we we monitor, uh, they like it that we're a green club. No, there's been no negativity towards that, none at all. Um, even when we announced it in the first place, you know, and even these days when you know we got we get a lot of flack from others and you know others in the footy community about you know Chris's involvement and the players involvement in it but the supporters themselves think it's fantastic and um, it's all been positive. Has it created new members? Uh, hard to say, probably not but hopefully as I said before with touching all these kids and you know getting them involved um, you know it, it'll be generational and we'll get a whole we'll get an uplift in that uh, yeah. 10, 15, 20 years time, so, yeah. But our, our supporters like it, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. How do you get fans that are spectators that are attending the matches involved in the various areas? Yeah, we have, um, it, it's, look, we don't do it at every home game because look, again, to be honest, we, you know, commercial interests take over. Uh, 
we've got to give publicity to our sponsors, our other sponsors, our um, yeah, our, uh, our partners in, and we don't get very much time at games. You know, you might only get. Uh, I don't even know what it is these days, Gore. You might get a couple of minutes yeah, if you're lucky on the scoreboard. Is that, is that what you get these days? It's not much. Yeah. And so you, you sort of focus primarily on your corporate partners there. But certainly on the green round, it's all it's all focused on that. And uh, and as I said, we've had a look at what we do on our website and just making sure that uh, we're about to actually embark on a competition for our supporters and things about you know, send in pics, tell us what you do, green run, green wise, and we'll, there'll be some sort of uh, competition winner for the green round that they might, you know, I don't, we, we haven't quite worked out what that will be, but that's something that's in the offing now too. So. Mm. Great. Greg, sorry, one well, more for me. Um, yeah. Just from a commercial perspective, is it a concept that you're looking to incorporate with your existing partners within their agreements? Um, and then I guess in addition to that, is it something that you've noticed has um, created, a, I guess, an opening in terms of a revenue opportunity for new partners as well? It's, uh, we certainly have a formal agreement with Vizzy, which is heavily focused on the green elements. Um, we're about to renew uh, Hyundai, and we just redid Mars. Um, we have clauses in all those contracts about the way we're going and we've actually they've come in and we've run them through our programs and um, you know <laughs> here's, a, here's a good dilemma for you we uh, we're obviously sponsored by Mars and in our show bags we were going to give all the kids a Mars bar but then we were we spoke about healthy eating and things like that so we decided not to put a Mars bar in which is not to say they're not but it, it, you know it's a mix so we've got you know you've always got those dilemmas and how trying to do the right thing by everybody, but then you'll get, you know, well, how can you talk about healthy living and sustainability and you're giving our kids chocolates. And so anyway, we don't do that. But um, certainly with our other sponsors, we, we speak about it. Uh, it's not, it's not like it's not a formal, it's not something we go back and forward with on clauses and contracts, but it's just, it's just known that that's the, that's the space we're in. And, um, and look, most of the big companies are. I mean, you know, we've been to Hyundai's uh, factories and things. I mean, it's incredible what they do, and um, they'd be they'd be at the forefront of anything green in the world. I would have thought from what, what we saw over there. So we sort of preach into the converted in, in a way, but everybody's really comfortable with working with each other and um, and promoting the fact that we are all green. Yeah. So has it got new sponsors? Um, no, but it's it's helped us. I, re I think it's helped us retain a couple that, um, you know, in, in, I won't say difficult times, but, you know, that have been a little bit on the, on the edge. I mean, even Vizzy itself, because, I mean, the, the background to that, obviously, was, you know, Dick Pratt was the president who owned it, and now it's changed, and the rest of the family own it, and there's different pressures and different influences, and, uh, but they really, you know, they're really pleased, just the whole group, about what happens, and so we've managed to retain them, even though, you wouldn't say it's a commercial deal, it's just a deal that, you know, a benefactor sort of gave us and uh, gave us a bit of a head start, which is which is which we've maintained. So that's been a, been a good thing. Yeah. And if, I don't think if we if we hadn't have been doing the things that we had, I don't think we would have kept it, or certainly to the amount that we've been been getting from it. So, yeah. so yeah. Oh, my question just follows on from that. With in terms of your relationship with BCE, I'm just interested in who's driving the delivery of the program, so whether it's club-based, busy-based, and how that relationship works. No, it's, works. it's definitely club-based. Um, <coughs> we sit down, uh, so we, we came up with the Environmaniacs program with, you know, we wanted to stamp it with them as well. Um, but we run it all, you know, we tweak it if we need to tweak it. I mean, we have changes of personnel, so we, uh, we retrain people, we, we run it. Yeah, it's our, it's our program, and um, I wouldn't say this if Vizzy were here, but even if Vizzy worked with us, we'd still run the program. So um, we'd ho hopefully look for another sponsor, but we'd certainly still run the program. Yeah. Greg, um, just oh. a question. Uh, it, it seems to be like a normal part of the uh, operations now, this green program. If you were to become CEO of uh, another club or just another entity entirely, would you look at introducing a similar sort of program to that organisation if you didn't already have one? Yeah, I think, I think I, yeah, I would, definitely. But I, th I think you'll be surprised. I think a lot of the clubs 
you know, they're as green as they can be anyway. I mean, it's just like, uh, it can be as simple as washing the jumpers and things like that, you know. We've got special detergents and special things that we've changed, you know, over the journey to uh, wash all the jumpers. It's, you know, we do it ourselves. We don't send it off to laundries now because we, we think that we can do it better and more environmentally friendly. So we've bought in all these machines and uh, for capital cost, but long term we'll be fine, you know. We, we do it, as I said, with this, the proper detergents that don't hurt the environment and things like that. So. And I think, I think most clubs have a green vent, I would think, in some, you know, as I said before, one of the things that we found is we save money, and that's one thing that all clubs want to do, is save money. And, you know, if, we, if we're smarter about the use of our energy and all the things that happen in a, in a you know, footy club, then you'll save money, and that's, you can go and buy a new Senate Ford or something, you know, so. Yeah. I was just wondering if the environment is probably obviously you get a lot of positive feedback from the when you're doing formal evaluations to establish whether there's actually behavioural influences on the kids, um, on the real factor. Yeah, we do. We've got we've got a, uh, like a follow-up program we do with them. Like we've got, um, we certainly do an evaluation early. You know, when it first started, we we not normally do it through the teachers, but there's follow-up programs. We actually. The other thing is we don't. The kids don't come in once. We bring them back again. So. Um, you know, they might be. They might come back a couple of years after they've been the first time, and you know, we run, as I said, we run quizzes and programs, and we um, we work with the school themselves. To, you know, and they actually, the school normally the school, as I said, some of the schools who can't afford it, we give them the basics of all the bins and all that. Or Vizzy actually do, and we you know separate them, and then they'll report back on how that's all going and things like that. So yeah, we 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 try and monitor it and. Uh, and it's an on yeah, it's not a one off, it's not a one off program. We, we keep we keep in touch and as I said we bring them back um, you know in intervals after the after the initial visit. So, yeah. Yeah. Great, Greg, um, there's so many things you can do at club level in terms of sustainability, you know, from recycling paper right through to having you know active water systems and what have you. How did you decide, how did your club decide to install the technologies or the or the the services that you install when there are so many available in the marketplace? We actually consulted with uh, a green expert at the time and they gave us a list of the things that we should do and I think we did about 90% of them I think. There was a couple that we just we couldn't do or were cost prohibitive but uh, initially that's how we did it. We had a uh, green architect uh, coming after the initial build and you know just I mean, we've got an altitude room, for example, that, you know, we, we have to be mindful that what effects that had, because that just pumps nitrogen into a sealed room and then how that all works. And so we got into it pretty heavily. Um, and yeah, just made the choices based on what they told us. But yeah, that was, so that, they didn't redesign the building, but they just suggested things, you know, ways and means, and they worked with the, um, you know, the normal, I suppose, what you would call, like most architects and things now have a, you know, if they don't have a green bend, they're probably falling behind. But we had a specific green architect come and work and sort of just outline what we should and shouldn't do. And we followed that. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll stop it there. But I, I really Craig, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. I, I was already impressed to begin with when I first found out about a lot of the things that you've been doing. But after hearing all of the things you're doing today, um, and he, by the way, he's uh, very good at representing just for the Americans, representing the Australian non-tall poppy syndrome, which is uh, you know fantastic because you, you said that it's part of your culture, it's ingrained, it's what you do, and um, and you don't really need kudos. It's just that you want to help out. So I think that that's fantastic. And if you could join me in um, thanking. Uh, Greg Swanson. <laughs>